My friends and I have been getting into paranormal investigations over the past few years. We aren't professionals by any means, nor do we claim to be. It's just something that we enjoy doing whenever we're all able to get together. We've gone to a few supposedly haunted locations and done some investigations, but nothing prepared us for what we experienced in this story. One of our friends suggested that we should check out this old abandoned school in rural Tennessee. We had heard stories about this school from videos on YouTube and online searches. A young boy was cornered in the boy's bathroom at this school by a bully. The bully beat him up so badly that he ended up succumbing to his injuries and died on the spot. The bully in a panic, realizing what he had just done, decided to pull up some of the floorboards with his pocket knife and stash his body underneath them. Because of how brutal it was, it is said that something very dark and malevolent haunts the school, as well as the boy. Some even speculate that this dark spirit is what drove the bully to take it too far and kill him. So anyway, we all got into our cars and drove to this school, hoping to have some paranormal experiences and maybe even capture some paranormal evidence that we could show off online. When we got there, we quickly realized that the pictures and videos we had seen online did not do the real thing justice. It was creepy. The entire place was covered in shrubbery, vines, and graffiti. The windows had been busted out and the doors were off their hinges, presumably from all the local kids looking to get a rush by breaking into and exploring a creepy abandoned school. We walked around the school and eventually found the entrance to the basement, which apparently you are not supposed to go into, especially the boiler room. Not just because the whole building was on the brink of collapse, but also because that's where IT primarily lives. So of course that's one of the first places we wanted to go. We walked around the basement and did some exploring, just to survey the area, and to get a better idea of where we wanted to begin our investigation. We eventually did find the boiler room, and at first glance, it didn't seem like anything special. Just some broken down equipment, graffitied walls, trash thrown all over the place and a random school chair sitting in the corner. Graffiti and trash were everywhere. The ceiling was falling in, and the floor was collapsing in some areas. We explored the halls, some classrooms, the gym, and we even found the bathroom where the bullied boy was supposedly buried underneath the floorboards. After exploring for a little while longer, we decided to start our investigation. We set up a couple cameras, motion sensor lights, and voice recorders in some of the classrooms, the hall, and the bathroom. As myself and my friend were looking down the hall, we heard a loud bang come from the far end where the staircase was. We quickly shined our lights in the direction of the noise, but we didn't see anything. We just assumed it was an animal or something. A few minutes later, we noticed that one of my friends was standing in the hall. He was ghostly white and fixated on the area where we had heard that noise prior. I asked him, what's wrong? He looked at me and replied, I don't want to freak you guys out, but I swear I just saw someone poke their head out from around the corner and look right at me. He insisted that we move on to another area, so we obliged him and went back to the main foyer where we had entered. We were standing there talking about where we should go next when we heard what sounded like a child's laugh coming from the classroom where we had just been. We all instinctively shut up and froze in place. A split second later, we heard a loud crunch and a crash come from the room, so we all ran to see what it was. When we reached the classroom, we were horrified to see that the floor had collapsed right where we had been standing moments earlier. We decided that that was enough of the classrooms, and we made our way into the gym. The floors felt much safer there. I took our dowsing rods and began asking those generic questions. Is anyone there? Can you tell us your name? Eventually, I asked the question, can you point to where you are? And to my surprise, the rods pointed in the direction of the darker corner of the gym. Guys, come here, I shouted to my friends. I'm getting responses. As my friends came closer, the rods began to move as well. Now they weren't pointing in the corner anymore. They were following my friend, Ethan. No matter where he moved, the rods followed him. This creeped us out beyond belief, so we wanted to know why the rods were following him. As we asked our questions as to why the rods were following him, someone eventually asked, Are you mad at him? And then, in an instant, the rods went straight and unnaturally still, and the room fell quiet. 
So quiet, in fact, that it was as if we had all fallen deaf instantaneously. I got this insanely bad feeling, as if something very evil had just entered the room. A few seconds later, I felt something strong physically grab the ends of the rods in my hands. Whatever was grabbing them began thrashing them back and forth with enough force to move my whole body, as if they were trying to break them from my grip. As this was happening, noises started coming from all around the school. It sounded like doors and lockers slamming, things being thrown down the halls and all around us and screaming. We were all terrified. We had never experienced anything like this before. Then, my friend Harry, the same guy who saw the thing at the end of the hall, pointed in the direction of the dark corner of the gym and let out a guttural, blood-curdling scream. We didn't even bother to look and see what he was pointing and screaming at. The only thing in our mind at this point was, get out now. We all quickly grabbed our things and sprinted out of the school, back to our cars. We got in and peeled out of there as fast as we could. We met back up at my place still obviously shaken up by what had just happened. We asked Harry what he had seen. He described seeing a massive thing, probably seven feet tall, standing in the corner. It had unnaturally long arms that were spread out wide. Its head had long devilish horns, and its mouth was open so wide that you could probably fit your head into it. He said on top of that though, on its unusually large mouth was a smile more evil than you could ever imagine. Knowing that something like that was so close to us was bone-chilling. In my opinion, we were lucky to make it out alive. We've never returned to that school and have no intention of ever going back. Believe what you want, but that night will forever be burned into our minds and haunting us in our nightmares. I first saw it happen at work. I'd just finished ringing up a customer when every hair on my neck stood on end. Something in my peripheral vision caught my eye. I work at a board game store, and standing in an alcove peering at the game shelves was a skinny dude with a scraggly beard. His back was to me, but when he turned sideways, right at the edge of my vision, I could see that his mouth was gaping wide open, like he was screaming. I glanced up, ready to laugh and ask him what was up, but the dude was just chilling, totally normal face. A slight wrinkle on his forehead, lips pursed as he read the back cover of Wingspan. He looked at me. Yo, I keep hearing about this. Is it any good? Slightly overrated in my opinion, I replied, but many people do seem to enjoy it. I'm trying to find a game my girlfriend might play. She's not really into board games and doesn't like competitive stuff. Do you have any good co-op games? Might I suggest a roll and write? Technically competitive, but you can't attack or interact with other players and mostly do your own thing on your board. They're also very beginner friendly, I said. I turned to grab one of the reserved ones from behind the counter, and as I turned back around, I nearly jumped out of my skin, because the man had approached so he was directly in front of the counter, and his mouth was wide open in a scream, eyes wide like he was a zombie about to bite me. But it must have been my imagination because as soon as I looked at him straight on, he just looked back at me, mouth normal. You all right there, my dude? He asked. Um, cartographers is our top selling roll and right, I stammered, recovering myself. But every time I took my eyes away from his face, in my periphery, he seemed to be like one of the undead, a corpse with a gaping mouth. I decided to ignore his behavior in the hope that he'd stop. He placed an order for cartographers, and I told him I'd give him a call when his copy came in. As I took down his details, much to my annoyance he did not stop, but continued to stand in my periphery, silently screaming. The next week when I went in for a haircut, the guy sitting a couple of chairs over was also playing dead. He appeared to be slumped in the barber chair, head lolled to one side, blue eyes wide and unseeing. But the stylist kept flitting around him, scissors snipping. And when I turned to look at him directly, he was no longer playing dead, but instead speaking to the stylist, one hand gesturing from under the cape. Yet when I looked away a moment later, gone were his gestures. I could hear his voice, 
but he appeared to be lying motionless in his chair in the corner of my eye. A corpse. This just kept happening. Honestly, I thought it must be some sort of online fad, with people randomly pretending to be dead. The internet has spawned stranger pranks. I don't have much of an online presence and don't keep up with popular memes or TikTok trends, and in my head it made sense. It remained a relatively rare occurrence for me, and mostly happened in large crowds. For example, the airport. That was where I finally figured out the cause. I was on my way to visit family, going through airport security. A little farther behind me in line stood a young couple who were pretending to be corpses whenever I stopped looking at them. It was annoying, and I kept turning my head quickly, hoping to catch them in the act. But they were always behaving normally the moment I looked directly at them. And of course, what should have tipped me off is that no one else in the line was reacting to their behavior. Only I could see it. But at that point, I was still acting under the assumption that everyone else was in on some new TikTok prank, and I wasn't. I put my belongings on the conveyor belt, and the couple in my periphery were now 100% normal. Finally, I thought, they stopped pretending. But the moment I collected my stuff and turned around, I nearly shrieked because both of them loomed next to me, standing slouched, faces contorted into death masks. You can't see sharp details in your periphery, but you can catch when someone is making a terrible dead face. But when I looked at them head on to tell them to cut that shit out, they were both normal, staring at me like I was the weird one. The woman actually hid behind her partner. That's when I realized two things. One, that I was the source of the weirdness. And two, that more specifically the source was in my stuff. I felt around in my pockets, my fingers closed on cold metal, and that's when it all clicked for me. I found my father's pocket watch. Now, a little background on this watch. Dad gave it to me the day before he died. It's cracked and doesn't run. He'd had it for as long as I can remember, and when I was little, I asked him why he always carried a broken watch. He told me it was a family heirloom, and that the cracks didn't matter because it told time in a different way. Those were his words. When he finally passed it down to me, he looked troubled as he told me. I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse to be able to see the things it shows. My father told me to sell it, but I never could bring myself to. What I'm still trying to figure out is why. Because as far as I can tell, there's no ambiguity about it. The damn thing is definitely cursed. See, once I knew the source was the watch, it all fell into place. At the end of that family trip, when I came back to work, I followed my hunch and looked up that guy who ordered the cartographer's game. He never came back to pick it up when it came in. I'd kept it sitting on the shelf for him, even though I should have just put it out on the main shelves for people to browse. It still had his name on it. I searched his details, and right away I found his obituary from that same week he'd come into the store. So, that's what Dad meant about the watch telling time in a different way. Now I wish Dad had sold it. Wish he'd given it to someone else. I know it's not his fault. Everyone has their time. But there are some things that maybe people are just better off not knowing. Knowing is definitely a curse. I'd rather not know. I should have thrown this watch away. But like my father and his father before, I just didn't. Now it's too late. I'm sitting here at home, and every time I pass the bathroom mirror, every time I catch a glimpse of my reflection at the edge of my vision, it's just too late to unsee my own dead eyes staring back at me. They always say you shouldn't watch your parents' old VHS tapes. I should have known that this rule also applied to grandparents' tapes. It's all still a blur in my head. It all started when I moved in temporarily with my grandfather, who lives alone. My plan to set up my own YouTube channel on UFOs and the paranormal had failed to take off, despite years of publishing online. I found myself unable to pay my rent and facing eviction. I felt so humiliated by the situation that I didn't dare ask my parents for help, preferring instead to call my grandfather. Since Grandma had left us, 
He had continued to live alone in his house, lost in the forest a few dozen miles from the city. I figured he wouldn't mind if I came to live with him for a while, just long enough to get back on my feet. When I asked him on the phone, he only hesitated for a second before agreeing. When I pulled up in front of the house in my car, he was already waiting for me on the doorstep with a big smile on his face. Thanks so much for taking me in, Grandpa, I said, giving him a hug. Don't worry, we all go through hard times. That's what family's for. Come on inside, it's cold outside. We'll bring your stuff in a bit later. One day in the late afternoon, the internet connection went down. This happened a lot, but it usually came back after 30 minutes at the most. But after waiting one hour, the internet still hadn't come back. I ended up getting up from the sofa and wandering around the house. My grandpa had left for the afternoon, so I was on my own. When I got upstairs, I saw a trap door on the ceiling that I'd never noticed before. I remembered that during one of our discussions, he had told me that he still had lots of VHS tapes, including one of my favorite childhood movies. A dinosaur movie I remembered perfectly, but had forgotten the title. I stared at the trap door. I'd been living here for a while and it felt a bit like home. I didn't feel like I was overstepping my rights, or if I was, he wouldn't mind too much. After all, there was only one room downstairs he'd strongly forbidden me to enter since that was where he butchered animals and didn't want me to set foot in it. I climbed up the ladder to the attic. Immediately, dust fell on me and made me sneeze. I climbed the rickety wooden stairs. The place was plunged into darkness, and not knowing where the light was, I used the flashlight on my phone. I looked around for a collection of VHS tapes, and I was surprised to see a sickle in perfect condition with an old TV set in front of it, itself resting on a piece of furniture. I opened the cabinet and shone the light inside. No children's cartoon tapes, but dozens of tapes with dates on them like January 20th, 1998, and nothing else. My eyes widened. What if these were old tapes of my father when he was still a teenager? I just wanted to have a look, just a few seconds, nothing else, then watch them with Grandpa. I smiled as I inserted a random VHS tape into the VCR. At first, there was nothing. Everything was black. Then a hand pulled back from the lens, and I discovered a scene that would remain engraved in my memory for the rest of my life. A woman, probably in her twenties, blonde and tied to an iron chair. The room looked like a slaughterhouse. Animal skins and carcasses hung on the wall. Knives and other implements whose function I didn't want to know hung on the wall too. Please, please don't do that, please! The woman kept shouting crying, and my worst nightmare came true. A younger version of my grandfather walked into the camera, axe in hand. Without any hesitation, he cut her head off with one clean stroke. I couldn't hold back the scream that came from my mouth next. Please tell me my grandfather isn't a serial killer.